I'm just to amplify a bit what uh, Humberto was saying. I had a couple of interesting discussions in between, and uh, we were talking some about, or I was thinking a little bit more about, <clears throat> for instance, the child who isn't cleaning up uh, when, what you do under those circumstances. But often I'll also say to the child that, <clears throat> gee, I could see Mr. Opposite is here today. So, because there's a defiance. Oh, wow, today, Mr. Opposite, oh, he came in pretty strong. And what I'm doing is I'm getting, <clears throat> in other words, I'm, I'm finding a metaphor that puts his, his conscious behavior, he knows he's Mr. Opposite, knows he gets into trouble, in, <clears throat> on, uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, I can then think about, in the case, why Mr. Opposite developed, you know, and give him a context from, it, from Mr. Opposite. Often, children act like Mr. Opposite, but at the same time, they'll have nightmares, they get especially anxious, etc., because their conscience is bothering them and they can't stop. When you bring Mr. Opposite, and then you give a human explanation for why, you know, like, uh, a lot of times, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of times, a Mr. Opposite can be very strong, especially when they have a mommy who, who left when they were very young. I mean, then there can be a lot of Mr. Opposite inside. So you begin, so that can be an interpretation. He doesn't know why he's Mr. Opposite. And I, what I'm providing, I'm speaking to his superego. I'm saying to him, there's a reasonable human explanation for this Mr. Opposite that we see here today. <clears throat> it's also Mr. No Clean Up, you know. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, <clears throat> I mean, that's how we'll use it. And I know from the history, this is why this is developed. The other thing which I want to say, too, <coughs> is there's often play. But in this example that I'm bringing, I often think about, well, this kid isn't playing today. Today, we see transference behavior. He's saying, screw you. I'm not, you know, so that I'll think to myself, well, I'm seeing not play, but transference. You know, he's acting out with me what he does with his father, what he does in other places. <clears throat> so that gives me a frame. And this is, and is this something that I want to highlight? Well, this kid is getting in trouble with the teacher, with his father. He's bringing it in here. Mr. Opposite is obviously pretty important. I may even have a folder with Mr. O, you know, the uh, uh, later that I'm going to put in. But so often there can be play, but then there'll often be transference behavior. And the other thing with transference is that the office is built. For transfer. For example, kids will draw something, and I, I have a wall they can hang it up, hang up there. The, uh, but I'll have, suppose I have four kids in treatment. Well, they can only have a quarter of the wall. But oh no, he wants to put his, and I'll say no, no, it hasn't. What we're bringing here is obviously the idea that there are other siblings. You see. Here, you know, or let's say there are a couple drawings, that, and this kid is watching the drawing, trying to make it better, and then just by accident he pulls off. <laughs> <laughs> he is bringing into my office a sibling issue. So often we have a parenting function, you know, the we become a parent in the transfer, and the room, <clears throat> and other kids. Who else? Who else lives here? You know. Uh, the, especially if you have other, no, this is a private, we can open this, this is a, a private room. Mm -hmm. So there are other siblings around. So the office has that quality, it'll bring in uh, sibling issues and you as a parent. In lecture number two today, uh, <laughs> I want to talk about the play relationship and the therapeutic alliance, the implications of what I talked about before about 
transitional play space. And, you know, often people will say that because of their experience in child work, this, this helps them a lot with adult work. And so I'm going to extend this a bit because I think that there are elements, important elements in play that we do with play with children which help you understand more about adult work and can enhance adult work a lot. This is this be interesting. I'd love to get your feedback and because I've had all sorts of reactions to this uh, discussion. Uh, and I guess I'll read some of this more. Uh, in psychodynamic theory, there, there's been conflict in, in the literature about the change process. What promotes change? And of course, a good old psychoanalysts say that the overwhelming centrality of interpretation and, and working through is the vehicle of therapeutic change. But there are a significant number of people that say <clears throat> that uh, a equal place or an important place too we have to give to the treatment relationship itself uh, and the affective components of that relationship. <clears throat> what the alliance is like and the meaning of the alliance. Uh, from my vantage point as a child analyst, it's clear that in order for me to work effectively with a child, a special affective relationship is critical for progress to occur. It has to be, uh, <clears throat> and this relationship has several important features. It's libidinal, it's not a rational relationship. Kids get attached to you. The child patient doesn't come in with future goals. He doesn't say, I smell bad, so gee, I want to see Chetha, so I won't smell bad, etc. Comes in because he's brought. Uh, an adult, we think, come, comes in because gee, I, uh, <clears throat> I've had five relationships with women, it always ends the same way, I want to get married, I'm going to see a Chetha. I could see myself before, and maybe therapy will, will change it. So there's a more rational idea, I want to change this problem. But I feel that that doesn't really carry the full thing, that other things occur in the relationship that are important, and that the alliance, even with adults, has some very important similar features to the alliance with children. Uh, now, typically with children, this affective component of the alliance is expressed in an interaction with the therapist, particularly through the expression of interactive play. And the aim of this talk today is to attempt to clarify some of the features of this, of the alliance generally. These are some of the components, and I'm going to come back to them. And I'm going to seek to comment on a number of questions. Can we understand this libidinal component of the alliance in child treatment and how it evolves in interactive play? Is there a developmental basis for the alliance? I've already indicated that I think that there is in the early parent-child relationship. And are there similar libidinal features in the adult alliance, in psychotherapy or analysis, that are expressed more subtly and less tangibly than in child work. In order to focus on play and its implications, I'm going to bring clinical material from three vantage points. First, a, a, an early toddlerhood, and I have a little tape, a uh, short film about a mother and child where play is evident in the interaction. Not, oop, in a minute. Uh, another from the Oedipal phase of development, I'm going to present some material from a six and a half year old boy where vigorous play erupted. And third, in adult psychotherapy, intensive treatment where emergent transference reaction <clears throat> became evident and were explored. 
Okay, number one. So this is a little videotape. Jenny is 13 months old. She is just six months older than the last baby we saw, but strikingly more developed. She sits up alone, aware of her surroundings, attentive to new stimuli. Although she may speak only ten words, she can understand far more and lets her mother know her wishes. This greatly enhances her ability to communicate. The playful interaction from which both mother and child are deriving such pleasure characterizes human relatedness in the early years before language develops. Jenny is just in the process of learning to walk. We are actually witnessing her first faltering steps She squeals with delight and seems proud of her accomplishment. Her mother's approval and encouragement will motivate her to take further steps toward independence. This is a pattern of healthy interaction that will undoubtedly continue throughout childhood. At this stage of development, objects begin to have permanence. When the rattle was removed from the last baby sight, it was as if it never existed. Oh, you little speak. You found it? Oh, you got it. For a year old child, the object exists in time and space. When the rattle vanishes, Jenny looks for it. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Oh, you little devil. <laughs> In the game of peekaboo, one of the child's first social games, the human object appears, disappears, and happily reappears over and over again, reassuring the child that mother's support will continue. The child's attachment to the mother is now complete. The baby knows who her mother is and feels safe and gratified as long as she is with her. If the mother vanishes, the child may feel great distress. It is for these reasons that Jenny's reaction to a stranger is so different from Michael's, as Jenny now has no doubt that the stranger is not mother. Even though mother is still present, the baby is experiencing a form of separation anxiety. This is a normal reaction at her age and means that she has formed a very close relationship with her mother. Okay, uh, I think this vignette kind of illustrates a number of important elements uh, that I want to describe in the early development uh, of play. And you see between the mother and child there's a sense of spontaneity, <clears throat> kind of joy and pleasure between them. Uh, and play is entwined with, uh, with the object. <clears throat> There's a mutual affective sharing, and the format of the play develops and has a form between mother and child. Good enough mother elicits pleasure and learning, and she gratifies through play and teaches through play. And Winnicott again calls this the basis for this transitional play space. It's not only the mother, it's not only the blanket, it's also the play itself is libidinized. It's seen in there. This becomes a state. In this close unit, we not only see attachment and cathexis to the mother, but also an intense attachment to an activity that they naturally develop in this function of play. And there are a number of specific features that I want to highlight in this interactive play, this care-giving relationship. One is, is that the mother has a capacity for empathy. She knows her child and feels attuned to what the child feels and her mood. 
So if, for instance, the child is tired, the mother will stop teaching. You know, you, she's going to, you know, the, uh, she isn't going to, if, if the child is restless or distressed, she isn't going to put that little thing behind the back. But if the child is there, this is a time. So the mother is attuned, there's an empathic quality. And she's a, and in this example, too, we see not only an empathy, but what we call a generative empathy. She is going to, she wants to naturally help the child go further, learn something new. So she's putting the thing that she's having into, and, and parents will do this intuitively, pick up something and kind of bring the child along in a more generative way. <clears throat> The union develops, too, because the mother has been a stable object. She's dependable. There's a dependability. When the new person comes in, etc., we see a different reaction, even though she looked like a good and nice enough lady, uh, but <clears throat> she didn't have the dependability that, uh, and the availability that the mother had. The other thing, too, is that the, the, the mother has a way of affect regulation. She's an affect regulator. So if a child, for instance, is going to get too upset, she will take that child and soothe the child. If the child is tired, you know that this mother will say, gee, it's enough today. I'm going to have to have her take a nap, too. There is, she kind of manages the uh, affective uh, world. And another thing that happens in this relationship that I want to, or in these relationships, is creativity. <clears throat> uh, we didn't, it's hard to see this with the 13-month-old, but I'll give you a little example. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> I used to, I had three boys, and every night there was a story, I would tell them. And the story was Bob I the Elephant. And for whatever reason, we had to read this directly. We had uh, <coughs> had to read it with the same words. <clears throat> After a while, you get tired of uh, So I would slip in another Bob on the whale. Oh, no, no. Bob on the elephant. Bob on the hippopotamus. Oh, Bob on the walrus. <laughs> I would get all these. And suddenly, one of the kids said, Aunt Barbara. The elephant, because we had a relative who was kind of large. <laughs> to me, this is incredible creativity. You know, this is the play with an idea, bring it and change it, etc. You know that you that you see. So I think in play with children, you have these components: empathy. Uh, <clears throat> dependability, <coughs> affect regulation, and creativity are aspects, I think, that we see in the early parent-child relationships. And I think good therapists carry these elements further, or can use them. Uh, so let's keep these in mind. It's hard not to if they're emblazoned on the wall. Uh, and let me bring you the case of Douglas, a six-and-a-half-year-old youngster. He's a handsome, intelligent, vigorous youngster, the oldest of two brothers in an intact family. And both parents were professionals and effective and thoughtful individuals. In his history, the parents describe that he's always been rhetorically active since toddlerhood. He's evidenced a lot of impulsive, aggressive behavior, the most common referral you know, that we get. He hit, kicked, bit other children, had temper tantrums, always needed limits. There seemed to be problems modulating all affects. In school, he was, had a poor attention span, attacked other kids, was easily distracted, and of course, ADHD, you know, et cetera. <clears throat> and while, and the use of Ritalin they felt, well, it was unclear as to whether it helped, but many problems persisted. And in my evaluation, it was clear he was counterphobic and very frightened internally. He anticipated attackers and punishers 
and they handle this by being the attack. You know, if, you, if you're scared, there are two kinds of children. There's one who, when they get scared, they go under the covers, and then there's another who take, go to bed with a baseball bat. And he was obviously of the second vintage. The purpose of my treatment was to help Douglas learn about some of these internal fears and to become <coughs> comfortable with them. In other words, if I could get to some of these underlying things and put them into words, etc., then maybe he wouldn't have to defend himself <coughs> as he had. There's no evidence of particular early difficulty of traumatic events in his life. He felt his mother could be somewhat intrusive and controlling, and he did have a tonsillectomy at age four which seemed to exacerbate some of his problematic behavior. I'm going to describe two phases of the early treatment of Douglas. <coughs> First, a period of non-engagement with little or no play, but secondly, a shift after five months into vigorous play. I saw him twice a week, and the parents every other week. In the early months of treatment, Douglas was a difficult patient, as many of these youngsters are. He was often directly angry at me. He would slap my face, he's going to say. He was provocative. He turned on the clock radio, put his shoes on the wall, tried to open the window. I'm up on the 19th floor. <laughs> and he used many curse words, see my rare fun, fucker, motherfucker, bitch. Often this behavior was accompanied with a lot of anxiety. Uh, eye blinking, rocking, told me when he would become 17 he would be so strong that nobody would mess with him. And if, it, he, if I commented that he seemed to be a little scared of me sometimes, say this is a stupid idea coming from a retard. So this is <laughs> Any attempt at clay was aborted. He might make several ships out of clay, but would quickly break them and damage them. Or sometimes bodies emerge, oh, something's going to have to be cut off body parts, but he could tolerate no words or attention. Yet in a general way over this period of time, he was becoming more comfortable in the office, more comfortable with the toys, and even smiled at me sometimes when I... Now, I want to say something about that, because often we say, gee, nothing has happened, but <clears throat> a lot of times... Uh, Things, obviously something was happening because he was becoming more comfortable. And becoming more comfortable with the limits that I set, that I'm not with uh, <clears throat> uh, the, if I say, oh gee, I see Mr. Ferocious is here, you know, that I have a label for him, uh, that uh, the, <clears throat> um, so that even though it looks like nothing is happening, a lot is happening if a child like this is becoming more comfortable in the place and when you set some limits and you <clears throat> there was a mark on the wall, well we're going to have to spend some time cleaning that off and, and, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> and you set some boundaries uh, and, the, <clears throat> and I don't scream and yell and push him out of the window and things like that then something is happening under, under those circumstances. <clears throat> and I did want to make one comment. It reminds me of a thought I had earlier. <coughs> that one of the big anxieties that uh, I find that people who are engaged with kids and they, that play will emerge and they'll often see the play and even sense that it can be important but they don't know what the play means. And they get anxious about it. Uh, and I think that's just a typical experience. That this is a new language for you. You don't know what it means. And you do need time to become accustomed and find out more about it. So this is, this is a big... I don't know why there's the feeling I have to be productive today, or, gee, we've gone three weeks and I'm, I don't know what's going on. The, uh, <clears throat> I think that's par for the course. It takes time to learn to learn this. Okay, back with Douglas. After about a five-month period, Douglas told me he was Jack the Ripper. And I wondered who I was. He said, you're the worry doctor. And I added, 
How old is Jack the Ripper? He says he's eight. <laughs> <laughs> then he adds, says, I guess I'm Jack the Little Ripper. <laughs> Now Jack and the worry doctor had clay guns. We made clay guns. The game he developed was that he knocked on the doctor's door. I asked who was there. He said, Jack the Ripper. And I was to get very upset and get my gun and shoot at him. And he hid behind the chair and we would shoot back and forth. So I hid behind the pillow. He went behind the chair. <clears throat> I'm not as athletic as I used to be. <laughs> In fact, sometimes if there's a fantasy the child has, and I get down on the floor, I get a leg cramp. <laughs> and by the time I straighten out my leg, the fantasy is gone. <laughs> there's a, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, now Jack wanted to play this every hour. We took a long time to fashion our guns. We had triggers, and sights, and bullet cartridges, and even sequins. During our play, after several vigorous shooting encounters, I talked about this. I commented about the play. I said, gee, he worried about big worry doctors. Hurt. And you know, I said, hey, you also worry about big daddies hurting them. Uh, I said, he liked to shoot me. And sometimes, like all boys, they have ideas about shooting and hurting their dads. They have two-way feelings. You know, the, uh, Douglas said nothing to me, but he began to talk with his mother at home. He worried about his dad. He, his dad was too skinny. His father was having some stomach trouble. Would his father get very sick? When the father took a trip, he was now openly anxious about his father, and he feared his father would be killed in an airplane. A good projection, you know, the... Uh, in the Jack the Ripper play, Douglas now became very impressed with my interested in my elaborate gun. He wanted to shoot it out of my hand, so we play that. He shot the gun and it would go flying, and then he'd take the gun and give it karate chops, and he extracted the bullets. And I began to talk about feelings boys had about daddy's guns. Uh, that boys felt jealous. And sometimes they felt they had little guns, and their dads had big guns. <clears throat> They wanted at times to break their daddy's guns, and they wanted at times to break their daddy's penis. Douglas picked up my gun and punched holes in it with a pencil so that all the piss, you see, could come out. At times during this play, he felt very, very guilty. And in the play, he wanted me to kill Jack the Ripper and riddle him with bullets. I, I don't know. I refrain telling him why. I said, had jealous ripper feelings. At home, he told his mother and father, I do bad things. I do really, you should send me to an orphanage. Uh, I, I don't think when I'm doing things. Douglas now wanted to come to treatment, and he talked to me in a very affectionate way. He would say, I'm going to see my Chethic. Or if he passed my office building, he would, this is my Chethic's building. Is he there now? And he was becoming much less of a behavior problem, and generally more, <clears throat> uh, particularly in the office. But he remained quite vigorous. Characteristically, after our Jack play of the day, we played sports. We developed a vigorous basketball game using a Nerf ball, and I have a hoop we attach it to the top of the door. And we constructed what I feel are fair rules. So either of us could win. I would obviously have a handicap, etc. If he cheated, which happened every single time, <laughs> I would comment, oh, I see we're using the Douglas rules rather than the what's fair is fair rules. In our Jack games, we were now shooting off parts of my body. Fingernails and thumbs went, and I would need immediate surgery. I began to comment, about his ten tonsillectomy, and we did construct a tonsillectomy because boys can worry, and so we went through what happened. He now decided, after shooting all parts of my body, to play Jack the Dick Ripper. <laughs> he would shoot off my penis, and I would hold myself according. 
in the crotch area in Wales, and this set off enormous pleasure. <laughs> uh, produced very intense laugh, and I was certain, and obviously I verbalized, I've always had jealous feelings <clears throat> with big worry doctors and big daddies and big dicks, and they had a lot of. <clears throat> Douglas' creative variations continued. After the dick rip <clears throat> hit his mark, he would have my wife come in and take a look at me, and she would be aghast <laughs> to see it like my vital wound, <laughs> etc. In my discussion with him, I knew he was jealous because, uh, <clears throat> uh, and boys had special feelings about their mommies, and that his mommy was pregnant. This is true. His mommy had become pregnant again. And this made them feel small and left out. And he screamed at me that she wasn't pregnant, she was fat. <laughs> Eye blinking ensued, and he said he wouldn't let the baby use his toys. But now he allowed me to talk, you see, for longer periods about jealous feelings, baby killing issues, and he kept his eyes closed. When I asked Gia, are you asleep? He said, no, he was in a coma. <laughs> and he wasn't going to come out for, for years. But in his play, and with my discussion, uh, uh, which focused on a lot of these small, scary feelings that he defended against, we saw less of the acting out and and more vigorous sport games after the rip Ripper story that actually adhered to real rules sometimes. And, he could, and when he lost, I said, and he didn't get so upset, I said, wow, this is really something. This is, wow, you could, you're a good player. <clears throat> and you could see someone asked about, or Umberto was talking about interpretation, that if we use the psychoanalytic, psychodynamic model, we'd say that this boy was counterphobic, that he had a lot of aggressive feelings, which <clears throat> he felt very, very strongly, but also felt guilty about, because we saw the anxiety, the eye blinking, etc. These weren't acceptable feelings, but they were driven quite strongly. So that if I normalize these, all boys have ripper feelings. Yes, all boys want to kill their daddies, shoot their daddies, dicks off, that um, have it be specially close to mommy, feel bad if daddy makes a baby. You know, the uh, if I verbalize these feelings, put them into words, what and normalize them, then I am ameliorating his. Uh, uh, super ego reaction, you don't have to feel so anxious about them, and also the need to counter them by this uh, aggressive uh, acting out uh, behavior. So it isn't enough just to play Jack the Ripper, but it's important to be able to give these Ripper feelings a context, why they're there. Of course, he makes it very clear uh, in his play. Now, how can we understand the play relationship that developed between Douglas and his therapist? Two aspects emerge simultaneously. One component is the transference relationship. Clearly, the worry doctor is a displacement for the father. <coughs> Combat with the feared, castrating father is lived out in his play. Jealousy, castration themes are very evident. You do need a history of you, you do need to not only have a history, but you also need to know about child development and the Oedipal complex. <clears throat> Jealousy, castration themes were very evident. The phallic Oedipal conflict, but also a pre Oedipal aggressive coloring, because this boy was aggressive from an early age, is verbalized in some aspects that are worked through. But a second and another critical component of the play relationship is the alliance, the relationship that develops between two players. Clearly, Douglas comes to love the play and the developing enactment of his internal story. 
I become my chatter. My chatter lives here. There's a growing loving tie to me. And obviously I enjoy Jack the Ripper. I am suggesting that I and Douglas recreate a transitional play space that Winnicott describes. I'm not only the bad worry doctor in the transfers, but also a special person who plays, explores, discovers, and elicits ideas. Douglas becomes creative in the relationship. Jack the Ripper, Jack the Little Ripper, Jack the Dick Ripper. He's an author who unfolds new scenes and chapters. And why does the alliance unfold? What is the therapist's contribution? <coughs> in the play situation, the therapist is attuned to his eternal life through the therapist's empathy and understanding he can verbalize and clarify Douglas's inner tur turmoil. <coughs> Over the months of regular work and regular appointments, the therapist also becomes a consistent, available, and enduring object that the child can rely on. He knows every Tuesday and Thursday, 4 o'clock, this is where he's going. And Chetik will always, will always be there, except when he's in Miami. <laughs> Chetik also functions as an affect regulator. He can allow the emergence of intense and important affects, but he also erects, over a five-month period, a safe atmosphere so that these affects are not uh, flooding and overwhelming. And there are opportunities also for the <clears throat> creative metaphors to develop. Once he says some of them, I'll use Jack the Ripper, Jack the Dick Ripper. <clears throat> the, uh, so these qualities of the therapy, empathy, consistent availability, affect regulation, creativity, <clears throat> foster this libidinal aspect of the alliance and form the context in which interpretive work can occur. This attachment, I am suggesting, has its history, a good enough mother-child relationship in their early libidinal play. And what are the curative aspects of this interplay? Douglas's acting out diminishes, and, and <clears throat> uh, the, the interpretive work is very important. He has these ripper feelings toward his dad, when the primitive aggressive feelings are slowly understood and put into words, <clears throat> this fosters some structural change because the harshness of his own superego. See, part of his acting out too was to get punished, was to have someone come down on him. So the superego for having these aggressive feelings, you know, but the intensity of his guilt diminishes since these are ideas he hears from me that all growing boys have. And I can put words to them and jealous feelings and, and the killing daddy for killing baby for you know, the But I'm suggesting to that there's another crucial component stemming from the play relationship that should be understood in object relations terms. <coughs> the therapist welcomes his internal life that unfolds through play. His inside ideas, his mind is valuable. Just as a young child feels enhanced when the mother approves of a child's creative productions, Douglas sees and experiences an accepting regard for his material and his elaborated productions. His internal ideas are fully respected. <clears throat> So that there is, I think, an important mirroring experience that goes on, that comes through this relationship. And because of the structure of therapy where these qualities can develop uh, and, and we build them, this gives you a, uh, a powering parental-like uh, component. Pause for... Fresh. 
So now I'd like to extend this um, because I think we don't. <clears throat> I think that one of the things that happens in many adult treatments is that yes, we come in and form an alliance based on pain, but I think that the alliance and the attachment is very very important and has some similar uh, features that we that I'm suggesting are here with dogs. <clears throat> this is an adult woman, and this is the transference and mergers, but I want to quote Freud because one can't have a paper without quoting <laughs> Remembering, repeating, and working through. He comments that the patient's compulsion to repeat is not only rendered harmless but useful by virtue of its admission into the transference as a playground, he uses that word, in which it is allowed to expand an almost complete freedom, and which it is expected to display to us everything in the way of pathogenic instincts that is hidden in the patient's mind. Therefore, associated with the transference is the emergence of a playground where the pathology is exposed. Miss A is a subdued single woman in her mid-thirties. She's an art teacher who conveyed an air of listlessness, hopelessness, passivity that overshadowed natural gifts. Uh, she came into treatment because she felt she couldn't adequately develop her artistic talents. She apparently had a lot of them, went to art school and was praised a lot, but never could sustain her work. <clears throat> Because of a pattern of disturbing relationships with men, she fell into relationships where she let herself be used and humiliated. Uh, though her artistic work had been promising in her younger years, she had given this up for routine drudgery as a teacher, and she felt stifled. She came from a very, very wealthy, intact family, salient in her history, was a striking, disturbed narcissism of both pa parents. Uh, much of her early care was left to maids. Her mother was always critical. Her mother was a beautiful woman and was critical of this girl, who I thought was attractive. <clears throat> uh, but how her daughter reflected on, critical of her looks, dress, and bearing, and the mother was often gone. The father was a very successful businessman with little patience with his daughter, and also very critical. <coughs> but he could ultimately be quite seductive with her, and throughout both her early years and as an adolescent. As far as we could reconstruct, there was never an open sexual relationship, but a lot of physical interaction occurred. Parents had a poor marriage, and they divorced when the patient was in her 20s. Miss A, for Miss A, her background was experienced as an enormous assault on herself and her self-esteem and individuality. She always felt there was something wrong with her. And as a child, she was plagued by the quest to find out what did she do that incurred the rejection that she received in contrast to an older brother who somehow fared much better. In our early work together, Miss A, fought to keep a loving image of her parents. She was the one that was always to blame. She tried to undo evident memories and events which showed their blatant disregard for her. And her dismissal of and their dismissal of her, which continued to the present. Her birthdays were never remembered. They never initiated a call or any contact. And she had to do all of the calling, and she was always to blame. She came to understand more of the parents' narcissistic limits. She could see that she was repeating in her new relationship what she did with her parents. This was with some of our work. She picked men who would exploit her. She attempted to ingratiate herself with him. She felt she had no rights, and she became a helpless victim. The period of work I will focus on emerged about one and a half years after the beginning of treatment, I began to feel a growing change in her demeanor. There was growing comfort and trust and a freedom in her associations. She smiled more often in greeting me. She was dressing better. 
using makeup and perfume, and where and she became more attractive. It was a definite beginning of a sexual ambience in the room. In his sessions, Miss A relayed that she was beginning a new relationship with a man <coughs> that had the same quality. His name, the old quality. His name was M. He was married, had known her for several years, but now he openly wanted her. What could she do? She had no one. She would submit and meet her needs so that she could get a little for herself. After meeting with him for a number of weeks, she described a growing sexual relationship. She was being used. She was only in the side. She wasn't central to him. And as I listened to this material, I was struck by an odd factor. When she referred to him, she used the initial M. Every other man that she had seen she called by the full name. It was always Harry or whatever. But this was M. I called this to her attention that she have any idea. <coughs> when she drew a complete blank, I commented, gee, my first name begins with an M. And she laughed spontaneously and pointed out that her fa father's first name also begins with an M. <laughs> a lot of M. From that point on, she would only refer to this man by the initial M. And it was clear she enjoyed this. It, it left us with ambiguity. Who was she talking about? A lover, a therapist, a father? I mean, there was a lot of... <clears throat> did her discussion have double or triple meaning? In, in my mind, I began to call this the M. <clears throat> One day she described sitting on M's lap. She could feel his erection. She had a sudden association to times when she sat on her father's lap. Then her father got excited like Em did. <coughs> she then recalled seeing me and my wife on the street. Ann Arbor was a small town. She will never forget my look. It was so cold and severe. Of course, I didn't really remember seeing her. <coughs> I wondered if my cold, and I said to her, I wondered if my cold and, and disapproving look doesn't come up now. As she discusses getting men excited, could there be some some of her own feeling of disapproval? Her reaction was to tell me that recently she's been feeling more and more like a slut. Over the next few weeks, <coughs> we followed some of these slut feelings, uh, and we uncovered how she would often, as a child, get her father to lie down. With she would only have to complain that she couldn't sleep, and then they would snuggle together for a long time. Miss A was now more openly seductive in her session. One day in this period, she came <coughs> wearing an attractive red dress, and she reported a dream. She's driving a little red sports car on Miata. She parks it near an elegant hotel, 19th, in a... <laughs> in a no-car uh, uh, parking zone. She leaves the car there and she doesn't care if she's doing something wrong. I commented that as she parks her little red sports car on the couch today, <laughs> perhaps she likes the wrong forbidden feelings that she's experienced. She laughed and told me that the relationship with M is changing. <laughs> she is turning on the charm, and he now finds her adorable. And do you know, she says, she really doesn't want him, she just wants to win. I commented, you want <clears throat> to see if you can beat out his wife. She associated to seeing me again and my wife at a concert. She felt terrible and left out. She says sarcastically, you look so cozy with all of those intelligent professors and intelligent couples. The material ushered in themes of being shut out as a child and in, as an adult. She became furious every time M talks about the dinners he attends, the tennis couples he plays with, the parties he goes to with his wife. She can't stand being shut out. She reacts every session <coughs> when I close the door at the end of the hour. A lot of memories then emerged about the parental bedroom. Her father could snow with her, 
play with her, but on special occasions he would put her out and lock the door. It was all right to play with her, but when she wanted, but when he wanted the real thing, she was locked out. Now, in her relationship with him, this is going to be avenged. This is going to be reversed. This time, she is never going to want to re. He's not ever going to want to re-enter the bedroom with his wife because of her special sexual ability. Throughout this period, as I noted earlier, it was often deliberately unclear which M Miss A was referring to. While ostensibly talking about her lover and how M found her irresistible, could she be wondering how M the therapist would feel? <coughs> I commented that she really enjoyed this ambiguity a lot. In fact, she enjoyed teasing and wanted me to chase her to find out her meaning, that she enjoyed the tease. Immediate memories began to come out of play with her, <clears throat> her father, but also a great deal of her play as a latency age child, which had really been repressed. She had no memory of this before. She and her girlfriend played chasing games with boys in the neighborhood for several years. The boys would chase and capture them. They would then tie the girls up and touch them in all sorts of forbidden places. These were very exciting games, which persisted for a long time and contributed, as we learned, to a compulsive masturbation, which had also been repressed. So she was a very overexcited, overwhelmed little girl. <coughs> She also had these boys watching her because she had a bathroom upstairs and she would go to the French doors at the end of the bathroom and disrobe for the boys. These were very exciting, persistent games in her childhood and we could see had subsequently created very intense guilt, shame, and fear of her impulsive. This was a period of very effective work with Miss A. <coughs> she began to see stemming from the transference development where we began to see Mrs. A's hidden Oedipal sexuality and competitive aggression. Miss A defended against these affects by listening to depression and helplessness. She developed punishing and self-defeating relationship because of intense skill. In this period we began to see her recover her vitality we began to see a real person, sexual, vital, attractive, angry, gains that became lasting with further work. We say close the M game period by breaking off with M, the, the man outside, <laughs> because she, she appropriately felt he wasn't worth it and there was no future for her. I wish to use this clinical material to highlight certain aspects of the therapeutic relationship with Miss A. The transference itself is an illusory object relationship. Miss A develops the M game with a therapist to live out currently, not consciously, but she lives this out, a seductive and frustrating relationship she had with her father, much of which was repressed. I'm the sexually desirable father. I'm the rejecting father who shuts the door at the end of the hour. I'm the disapproving father with a cold, icy stare. While Miss A attributes these qualities to me, it becomes clearer and clearer that these are make-believe as if features in our relationship. The players, therapist and patient, have roles, father and daughter, which stand outside of reality. The alliance coexists with the transference. Miss A becomes allied with me in constructing and reconstructing a critical relationship with the past. In a sense, as with Douglas, she becomes intensely involved in a play process. An important quality of play in childhood is the capacity of letting go. Within play, <coughs> children can up to a point abandon themselves. They experience a sense of freedom and are less bound by the demands of reality. This letting go has its parallel in the transference regression. Miss A clearly begins to let go. Some for gratification. I think she wants to find out. 
but also for the scholar. Both are there. Miss A becomes a little red sports car, parking in the therapist's forbidden zone. <coughs> she becomes the sexual tease, taunting the therapist with ambiguity. The parallel letting go mirrors closely the healthy regression into play that children use. When mother and child play together over a period of time, they develop special code words and signals, a secret and special communication within a small, closed group. <clears throat> An evolving treatment has many of the same qualities. The end game was a metaphor that only the patient and the therapist could understand. The dream material, the red miata, assumed symbolic meaning and was understood together. The play, the game or play for each session became a reenactment of a past seduction which was lived out and now understood in this closed group. As with Douglas, special qualities in the ongoing treatment situation promote a transference regression in this <coughs> and, and also a sense of trust within the alliance. These qualities include the therapist's capacity for empathy, which he demonstrates by his understanding of verbalization, the sense of dependability and availability as a constant object. The therapist's capacity is an affect regulator. I'm not allowing anything to go beyond a verbal uh, state and creativity, symbolic formation, the use of uh, metaphors, where the expression of intense affects can emerge safely within boundaries. These qualities again mirror the close libidinal relationship between parent and young child. I'd like to conclude by making a number of general points. When I speak of play elements in adult treatment, I'm not literally suggesting that the therapist be really humor, play, or act playfully. I'm suggesting that the structure of a uh, uncovering treatment promotes a special bond that's akin to the transitional play space of early childhood that things can be lived out in an effective uh, way. On a number of occasions, I've made an analogy between the treatment relationship and the caregiver relationship, and that aspects of the past relationship become re-evoked through empathy. <clears throat> While both mother and therapist use empathy, it's important to highlight that there are significant differences between the two. Uh, therapeutic empathy is not just intuitive. We develop our capacities by training, by integrating a vast body of knowledge, by years of our own treatment uh, that gives uh, us extended <coughs> self-knowledge. And while the caregiving relationship still operates, the therapist utilizes many highly developed functions to create effective analytic empathy. A number of years ago, Lowell wrote a paper on the nature of therapeutic action in psychoanalysis. And, and <clears throat> he declared that therapeutic progression and the resumption of ego development is contingent on the relationship with a new object, with the therapist. He noted that within this new relationship, integrative experiences take place. These are experiences of interaction, comparable in their structure, he felt, to the early mother-child relationship. So that I feel that Miss A and other adult patients develop a libidinal relationship, a loving alliance, <coughs> uh, uh, and that uh, where the structure of treatment uh, uh, is is fostered and the interpretations then have much greater meaning. That the two things are, are, uh, are uh, often necessary. Thank you.
we have some questions now. Let me uh, make an announcement. Uh, some of you, those that are members of the Institute, are aware that half of an number has <laughs> come to Tampa in the last couple of months. We still have some more people to come. We have Fred Bush, <coughs> which is a well, still is training analyst and uh, was here recently. Then uh, we have the Novice. Recently we have today more from Chetik and next Friday. Unfortunately it can be on a Saturday. But it'll be next Friday morning we will have Carol Osted, which is as well a very well trained child analyst and she will be talking about the development of the uh, conscience in children <coughs> and uh, giving so a lot of clinical examples. I think uh, uh, Mort uh, gave you a very good uh, clinical example of the comments that I was making earlier, the complexity of being a child analyst, not just child play. You need to know a lot of things. Um, and I want to encourage you, that, those of you that have an interest in that sort of thing, in being trained and uh, uh, appropriately. You want to do the best you can, you have to get the best understanding, well, you have to be trained. That's the only way to do it. And uh, luckily, um, there is an opportunity at the center to do that. Unfortunately, in this town, there are relatively few analysts, uh, adult analysts, and there are even less child analysts. I believe there are only two, Francis and I, that have uh, trained as child analysts. And so we obviously need child analysts in Tampa. There is an enormous need for them. And uh, I hope that some people will be encouraged the comment I wanted to make <coughs> is, uh, as I know, uh, if it would happen, it is, has been a very instructive and uh, enlightening uh, session. Uh, Mott has a particular way of describing clinical material, which is very clear, very unique to him, and uh, very informative. And I think we have seen a good example of that today. Um, the comment I wanted to make is in relation to, which we frequently talk about here, the past prototype. You refer to the object relationist, thinking that the relationship has something to do, as if they have discovered the Mediterranean, because object relations have always been an entire part of psychoanalytic thinking. Uh, but there are groups of people that have singled out a piece. I always say it's like a chair. Yeah, they took the leg and said, oh, look at the leg. This is it. The leg is it. No, the chair is more than the leg, you know. And from the very beginning, the leg was part of the chair. That's what happens with many of these things. So that you have an idea. I started my training in, as a child analyst after I was well into my adult analysis in London. I did my child training, as many of you know, with Anna Freud at the Hampshire Clinic. And when the time came to uh, start a patient, I had chosen to start with an under five. In fact, I was recommended that I do that. And so, being uh, kind of ambitious in that sense, I went to Anna Freud and said, Mr. Freud, please tell me who is the best uh, supervisor for under five in this, uh, in London. And she said, well, Mrs. Hoffer, that was a problem. Dr. Hoffer was my analyst, and so it became a very <laughs> simple kind of relationship. But as, as you will assume, I didn't miss the opportunity that she was famous uh, as the best uh, child analyst uh, for under five in town, and I went to see her. And I talked to her, I, I took my under five material, and she said to me, Dr. Nahera, <clears throat> I know by reputation that you have a lot of talents, so don't come back until you can tell me. I will start the supervision when you come back, whenever, however long that takes you, and you can tell me that this child likes you, that you have a very good relationship to him, that he wants to come to see you. And when you are there, then you come back to me and we start the supervision. Well, you will say, why would she do that? Well, for a very simple reason. Small children of that age, indeed latency children, have no reason to come to see you. You know, 
It's not like an adult that he has uh, a neurotic suffering or anxiety or is uh, impotent or is uh, depressed, whatever it is, that may be the motto that leads him to the office of whoever he's going to see. Children's symptoms bother other people, <laughs> not them, <laughs> for the most part, <coughs> except perhaps in adolescence or very late latency where they start to develop a kind of uh, feeling for what the consequences of the symptoms are like for themselves and for others. And that was the reason. Uh, she was simply telling me, which puzzled me a little bit at the time, you know, because I, I was feeling, I never seen under five, and I was feeling a little lost. And uh, talented as she saw I was, I really was quite lost at that point. And, uh, but it was very clear, she's a pillar of the relationship with the child that will be the motivation for the treatment. If the child likes you, he will want to come to you. He will want to interact with you. He will want, you will become my chefic for him. You understand what I mean? And when you become my chefic, you can help that child. If you are my no chefic, you can't help that child at all. So that was the comment I wanted to make. Okay, and Bernie, let me ask you a question now, because with what I'm saying in this, <clears throat> Let, let's say you were beginning your your adult training, and you picked out the best person. They picked out the best person. How would you feel if that person said, "Fine, I'll work with you, but you come back when we know that this patient likes you." I wouldn't go to that person ever again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the reason for it is very simple. It's a completely different situation. With an adult, you can sit, they are rational, they can verbalize, you can look at the resistances, you can look at the problems that may lead them not to want to come to see you or whatever it is, and uh, you can negotiate these things. You cannot do that with a child. An adult probably has motivations, and if you find that he has none, you say, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, why are you coming to see me? I always. You really don't want to be here, go home, you know, or whatever it is that you want to be, rather than here. So, no, I, my attitude will be, bye, thank you, and then I'll be back there, obviously, yeah. But let me take it one step further. I mean, I agree. I think that's what, and in my paper, I would certainly say, that's why, why, um, uh, that's why patients come, they're neurotic, they suffer. But I'm saying in this that I think after a while they begin, uh, and that it's often very important, that they form a, a my chethic kind of connection with you. And that is an important ingredient, not maybe necessarily, maybe it's not necessary, but I'll struggle with that, but it's an important ingredient in their change and their getting better. And that qualities of this, the uh, uh, this uh, loving relationship with a child are also important and perhaps necessary in adult work as well. Oh, absolutely. That's uh, the concept of the concepts. Only that, <clears throat> as you rightly point out in in that example, you can see the different type of transference that a patient can develop. The one that helps therapists and analysts the most is the neutralized transference, which means the neutralized affection for the parents, not the sexualized affection for the, the parents. That's uh, yeah. an obstacle and a resistance and has to be dealt with and is usually part of the psychopathology of the patient because it's an unresolved issue. But without the neutralized transference, from the parents into the treatment situation. You have no treatment. You can't treat them. There is no treatment possible. Yeah, no, you are absolutely but, right about that. But the neutralized relationship, would you say, is a, is also a libidinal relationship? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it has some libidinal okay. components. With, yeah. So but not sexualized components. Not, it's no, loving, no. affectionate components, which are different. Right. I know they call that. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. When you were working with Douglas and you were doing the Ripper game, 
Um, did you, when you started to verbalize and normalize what he was acting out, was it during the play, or was it like separate time after the play was over, or how did you integrate that in? Mm. When was that integrated? Yeah, it, it would tend to come after uh, after an, an intense play episode, and I was like, oh, my God. you know, oh, gee, you know, the so we would play out an episode. Mm -hmm. Let's say we're playing out the gun, and he knocks it out, and all the piss comes out, and you know, I, then I would see at that point I would then make a comment about the uh, so that. It, you know, about <clears throat> boys' feelings about their daddy's guns. Mm -hmm. the, uh, so I would allow the the play to unfold. And in this case, it would be an episode that had a beginning, middle, and end. He picked up and was, was <clears throat> and then I have, so it, sometimes it would, that would end in the middle of a session, then we'd have time to play our basketball, right. but fair is fair, you know, but usually at the end of an episode of that play, I would, I would make a comment. Okay, and what, um, in regards to using play therapy with children, I, I'm a grad student, school so short, and I'm, at my internship I'm placed in sort of a, a short term, you know, um, average number of sessions is eight. I mean, we can go over, but you know, we have to justify that. Um, so in terms of that, when you don't have a long period of time to establish this relationship, I mean, you can, I have established a relationship already, but it, you know, it's not months worth of relationship. So how do you deal with, um, like, do you need, in that case, when we have a shorter, condensed amount of time, do you need to direct the play more? I would say yes. I, I would try to get in. If I, if I know I'm going to be limited and I can conceptualize something about what, like, is a divorce in two houses, I think I would then bring in more two houses, one right. here, one, you know, yeah. something that would bring, bring this up. Uh, and then, because I want to try and get at some of these <coughs> things, uh, I would find some ways to bring it. And I'll do that even in a longer term. Yeah. yeah, your comment about beginning, middle, and end is very helpful to, for me to think about when you begin to intervene because it seems to me in my experience if there isn't that progression that's taking place and you intervene, you stop the play. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a very frustrating experience to see something developing. It's very meaningful and you make an interpretation and the child's not ready for it, the play hasn't developed, and all of a sudden you see this wonderful, rich material just sort of dissipate, right? Mm -hmm. right. Because yeah, you can interrupt. Too soon. Right, you can interrupt, yeah. And that becomes intuitive, you know, the, uh, and you shouldn't feel, in no way should you feel, gee, I have to make an interpretation today. Right. Uh, you're going to have plenty of chance, you know, the, and you can also feel you can make the wrong interpretation you know, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, that, because uh, often there is just a, a lot of pressure. I think it's unfortunate that, gee, I really have to produce, and, you know, the, uh, uh, and uh, so that, um, you know, I'll often find, gee, I, I don't understand what happened today, and I have nothing to say, and lets me, Think about it. You know, you know. So I hope I, I can help take off some of that big super ego looking down on you. Know, so you have to produce. Yeah. Anything else? Or, yeah. You didn't talk about um, kind of counter-transference feelings when you're playing with kids, and that seems for me. I I guess when I'm stuck or when I don't understand what's going on or when something's repeated over and over and over again. That seems to help me, and I'm wondering if you have any comments about that. Just to f see what my experience is, and to imagine this kid trying to communicate, maybe in some way his experience. Yeah, you know, the uh, there's a lot of you know, the. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, 
the there'll be times you get very irritated with a kid, and uh, but they treat you sadistically. I think sometimes just you know repeated sadistic treatment of you. All right. So it's important to understand, gee, why, what, what's happening now, why, and it's always a good first step if you can anticipate that feeling. A lot of it also is a big natural countertransfer is the rescue feeling. These parents are terrible, you know, and you want to do something and do it too quick, and often that, that's a countertransfer. You haven't mentioned um, having a dollhouse. You don't have one, I guess. No, but I don't see anything <clears throat> anything wrong with that. I, I think that's that's fine. That the, uh, the houses will often have two pieces of eight by eleven paper. People to go back, but <clears throat> uh, but a dollhouse is fine because you can. Again, it's something that you can project on, onto, it can be a house. Uh, <clears throat> it isn't, there are no rules for it. You can use it in any way, shape, or form. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.